Good afternoon and good morning for our friends in UK. With great pleasure, I would like to warmly welcome all of you to this special session on analyzing development in developing economies organized by the Tsubatuma Foundation. Tsubatuma Foundation works globally in the areas of international relations, diplomacy, area studies, gender, financial, environmental, scientific, strategic, and defense policy. The distinguished speaker for this special session is Professor Stephen Darpon, noted economist, developmental policy expert, and professor of economic policy at the University of Oxford. He has been a developmental policy advisor to the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom. He's also the director of the Center for the Study of African Economies at Oxford. He was the chief economist of the Department of International Development, Government of the UK from 2011 to 2017. In 2018, the Queen of the United Kingdom awarded him as an honorary companion of the most distinguished order of St. Michael and St. George for services to economics and international development. His latest book, Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose, has been recently published in May 2022. It's a great pleasure, Professor Dakon. Uh, thank you for being here among us. Uh, we are here to discuss a very pertinent subject. Uh, the Tilotuma Foundation works on uh, many aspects on economic and developmental policy is an important focus area uh, of the foundation. Uh, now I would request uh, Professor Stefan Darbon to begin with this special address. Over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, the way I propose to do this is to talk uh, for about you know, uh, maybe 25, 30 minutes, and then hopefully there will be lots of questions. I'm going to talk a bit about my book on gambling on development, and I uh, will especially focus a bit on, on what it may mean for India, but there's also other ways uh, that we can later on uh, pick up. So I'm going to, for a moment, share my screen so they get the slides properly up uh, so that I uh, offer you the right presentation. So, um, this presentation, I'll just briefly introduce um, some of the core ideas of the book, and I also will want to give you a bit of a sense of what it may mean in different countries. You know, the, the book discusses quite a lot of cases. I am uh, covering, of course, not every country in the world, and also India in the book is maybe only covered uh, in a very limited way. So I look forward to, to further discussion with you on this, but also, you know, other countries uh, in, uh, for example, in Central Asia, where the foundation is quite, quite active, or, or at least involves in thinking about it, uh, you know, there's relevance for it here. But my starting point is really, is, um, is a very, um, you know, striking and quite an important stylized fact that we have experienced in the last, you know, three, four decades. And this is actually globally a remarkably strong and uh, fast decline in the levels of extreme poverty and you know even though I focus as a development economist on processes of growth across societies you know one thing I've always done in my career is very strongly focused on what's happening to the to the extremist um, the people in most extreme poverty now these data are from the World Bank there's always issues there with the beta but I would still judge this as the, the best comparative source between countries of what's been happening. And if you look quickly at this picture, you know that by 1990, we had um, well, close to 2 billion people in extreme poverty in the world. Now, where were they? Well, the red thing is what ha was happening in, in, East, uh, in East Asia. Um, and of course, that meant, you know, China, probably about 800 million people were in extreme poverty at that moment. Now, what we see, of course, is that what's been happening in the in the red block is that when we come to about 2018, which is the last year that we have some reasonably high quality data, um, you know, you actually got a massive poverty eradication. That doesn't mean that the whole region is rich there now, but actually in the most extreme form of poverty, which is below uh, about $2 a day in international dollars, so in purchasing power for the US, which would mean in India, for example, something like five and five to six dollars. Um, the number of people that are below uh, them in China uh, declines quite dramatically. 
what's then quite important also is to notice in the orange bit. This is actually South Asia, of course, in, in terms of population that is largely India, or at least in the largest number, that actually we had in this period, initially, um, more or less population growth keeping up with, uh, with, with growth in the sense that the number of extreme poor people um, was kind of stagnant. And after about 2000, 2005, we also saw quite important decline. I'll come back to some of the India data later on. But the most important thing here to actually notice is the huge difference that it has done with Sub-Saharan Africa, the blue part, where if anything, the number of extreme poor people has actually still been increasing to something like 450 million, 500 million. Now, COVID, of course, has affected this, but affected this may be less dramatic than some people would say. Very dramatic in one sense that it probably is the largest short-term increase in extreme poverty we've seen since the Second World War. But at the same time, it tends to set us back about five, six, seven years. So it's, you know, we are going back to where we were probably in the period around 2015, rather than actually saying that it's all going to put us back decades. But still, of course, it's quite important. Now, the important thing here is this difference between what was happening in different parts of the world. And I'm someone who studies Africa a lot, and everybody done, and I already did it, treated Sub-Saharan Africa as, as if it was only just one entity, as if it was one country. But without going into lot, much detail, even in Africa, we see this differential progress. We have some countries where actually the number of extreme poor people have, like Ghana and Ethiopia, over this period, while in other countries, it actually uh, more than doubled. And there's a country like the DRC, uh, countries like Nigeria, uh, Madagascar, where in fact the largest increases took place. Now, this is where it gets interesting in India as well, is that look, one thing that anyone looking at extreme poverty, in fact, anything these days in India, and I don't shouldn't probably get started on this, but in recent years, poverty numbers are not being released. And we have actually a problem to get a, a really clear pattern, a clear sense of what's been happening in the last decade or so in India. In fact, the last official data come back to the NSS of 2011 and 12. But what is also striking in India is that not just that some states still have very large extreme poverty, you know, in terms of the largest one, uh, you would have UP or Bihar and also Chhattisgarh. Uh, you actually have still extremely high levels of, of percentage of population in poverty. But it's also that the declines have been uneven. We have much faster declines in poverty since the 1990s in states like uh, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu than, for example, in UP and Bihar. And in fact, over this longer period, the number of extreme poor in Assam, uh, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, uh, you actually have probably a stagnant number, a small decline maybe, but not enough to be confident on these declines. Actually, in that sense, it's not that different from what the differentiation that was happening in South Africa, of course, in your case, at the state level. This is actually given a very large decline that we had overall in the, in the, in the numbers of extreme poor in India. Again, this doesn't mean, mean people are all rich. This is an extreme level of poverty using this World Bank type of definition. Here, this is actually using the India level of uh, the, the, the poverty line for India itself, the national poverty line. But that, again, that's a very minimal level of standard of living. So I don't want to try to say that everybody's well off suddenly in these, in these states that I, that I suggest where there was very fast declines. But I just noticing, of course, there's a lot of debate now. Sujit Bala would now say there's no more extreme poverty in India. I'm a bit more skeptical in the way the Bala's uh, methods, so I'm not going to subscribe to that. But there will be people on the call that know these debates much, much better. But there's a method issue, but there's a data issue in India as well. Behind it, and I'll come back to India, what it may mean, because it means actually that the thesis that I will make for countries may well matter for states in India as well. Behind all this is, is economic growth. There's no country, and let me also say no state, that actually can sustainably reduce poverty without also getting an increase in what's happening in the economy as a whole. Uh, this is a picture to show a bit of this differentiation. You know, we see there, there in GDP per capita, this is a done in a way that it can be compared between countries, so correcting for purchasing power. China, of course, has this massive increase. 
but Indonesia is one of these countries that has a steady increase with one crisis point of 1997, the Asian crisis, but actually a steady increase as well. India actually initially was staying a bit behind to Vietnam, in Vietnam, of course, a much smaller country, but did it in a very different way, but actually is a very similar pattern. We have that actually Bangladesh, where I was last week, that actually is quite a remarkable study. And anyone who is listening in from West Bengal could actually notice that Bangladesh has so outperformed West Bengal in so many indicators over this period. Um, and um, But also we have African countries like Ghana, but then we have Nigeria that if it wasn't for the recalculation of GDP figures, we would have had a stagnant line. Let me not go into detail, can always ask that. Or take the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, who actually even at GDP levels, in GDP per capita, is now poorer than it was in 1990. And in fact, um, much, much poorer than it was in 1970, which is a steady decline of this country, probably now a stagnation. But we get unlikely places like Ethiopia that actually have improved a lot. You know, Bangladesh is worth mentioning here, you know, in the 1970s, late 1970s, Henry Kissinger's uh, you know, the former Secretary of State in the US, still still alive now, uh, I think he's past 100 now, um, but a very smart brain in the US. He said basically Bangladesh will, will go nowhere. In fact, he called it a basket case. Nothing would ever happen. And of course, we see huge progress, not just in GDP, huge export performance, but also in social indicators, not least for women there as well. Similarly, Ethiopia was totally written off. It had actually a dramatic progress in in development economics that tries to actually tackle this. And I'm building very much on what lots of work that other people have been doing, but there is a bit of a difference in the thesis that I get. You know, you get a lot of these people and uh, it's, it's a good thing for a quiz one day, how many of these famous economists do you recognize? Of course, we have Amartya Sen there as well, uh, the, who you, I hope that you would have recognized uh, if you're dialing from India, but, but others there as well. They've all written best-selling books. These are not necessarily the best books in development, but they definitely shape a lot of the thinking that's there. In fact, these are some of these books. Uh, they're all now about at least 10 years old, and in fact, uh, but they became a bit like in the jobs I was doing, advising governments and so on. These were often the books that people had read, had seen, and they actually, but they have very different theses in terms of how development comes about. And I tend to really now increasingly think that at some level, they are these amazing books, and on another level, they're not very helpful. They tend to typically give prescriptions, often as economists like to do, of what you should do and not do. What are the policies you should do? What are the policies you should not do? And within it, there are some very big competing diagnoses. You know, there's one group that you can refer to what, for example, uh, Darren Asimoglu and um, Jim, James Robinson having Why Nations Fail became a very popular, very famous book, bestseller book. And, and it basically encapsulated what a lot of uh, in development economics people would subscribe to. It's saying fundamentally development will take place if you first get your institutions right. And so the whole advice is get your institutions right. What do we mean by is basically your political system, your judicial system, your civil service, <coughs> your rule of law, property rights. They have a list that they will give <coughs> and that, uh, that needs to be ready. Now, the problem with this is that me as kind of working in the policy advisory world, <coughs> how can I go to, to a country that's still extremely poor and basically says, well, you first get, need to get your institutions right before you can start. But the institutions, according to the analysis, is formed through history. So my advice to you is, why don't you get yourself a better history? Now, surely I can't do this, but that actually is fundamentally often the advice. You know, we say these institutions get shaped through history. They have underlying cultural historical factors, whatever you would subscribe to, but that's not very helpful because you are where you are. And then, you know, what do you tell me then? But it also another thing that it doesn't answer very well. <coughs> Anyone who studies Bangladesh in 1980, including Henry Kissinger that I quoted, would have said, well, this is a really quite dysfunctional state. This is full of conflict, full of instability, uh, full of dysfunctional government, huge corruption and whatever. But similarly, someone who studies 
China in the 1970s would say, look, this is a question and I, I'm old enough to just vaguely remember people talking about in the late 1970s, will China survive? And what, what we had as a history is that the 1960s, we had the Cultural Revolution, we had lots of upheaval after Mao's death in the early 70s. We had then basically the Gang of Four competing, uh, which is basically Mao's widow. There was a lot of instability in this country. It wasn't at all evident or self-evident that in 79, we would get this kind of policy change and everything would work. In fact, that was a really quite surprising development that it was hard to, 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 to expect to have happened then. And what I'm trying to say is that these places, whether it was China or, 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 or Bangladesh, and there I say uh, Indonesia in the 1970s when it turned itself around, or other places like Ethiopia in the early, early 2000s, that were actually countries that were definitely not with well-functioning institutions. But they still started to grow quite fast and do quite a lot in terms of development. So, the question is enough, you know, if you have to wait for perfect institutions, so um, how could they have done it? But also the other way around. If we then now want to reinterpret these places as if they had perfect institutions, and often people do this on China, said, look, it had 2000 years of centralized bureaucracy. It had 2000 years of meritocratic uh, bureaucracy as well. The state was strong. It had done taxation for 2000 years, all these kinds of things. But why did it then have to wait until 1979 that it suddenly starts growing? Why didn't it do that in the 17th century or in the 18th century or whatever? So what did success cases then wait for? Um, what did they wait for in, in, in that respect? Now, so the institutional thing, institutional approach, of course, it matters, history matters, but it doesn't tell us enough why it can happen when imperfections are there and why it happens then at a particular moment in time. Now, it leads, of course, to an alternative explanation is that somehow or another, those people in charge at that moment start doing things right. They start getting the policies right. But then the question is, if it's all about simply getting the policies right, the question has to be asked, why then and not before? Why do they then get the policies right? And before, why don't they do it? Or in countries that stay behind, and I mentioned Democratic Republic of Congo, or dare I say UP or Bihar, why don't they get it right then? Why is it such a problematic case? And dare I even use for UP that uh, Mr. Kissinger's words of basket case may well be at times applied. You know, why is it so dysfunctional? Why isn't it not making the progress it could make? And why is it not functioning? So why don't they? is then the question to ask. I'm also provoking you now, of course, you should uh, push back if you want to later on. I definitely saw this in action in two countries that I know very well. And this is basically in the DRC, this is Kinshasa, is the prime minister's office. And on the right hand side, uh, I have a picture of the, the office of the prime minister in Ethiopia. It's a difficult state, Ethiopia. I couldn't take a picture of it as a photograph, but basically had very contrasting experiences. You know, as a policy advisor, I was working at the time as chief economist of DFID, so basically the UK Development Agency. And, you know, it was quite common that I would be invited in prime minister's office or finance ministry's office to actually listen to the plans they had for the economy and for development. And obviously they wanted them to ask support from, from the UK in implementing them. So I did this within a few months apart in the DRC and in Ethiopia. And in the DRC, I got the perfect plans. They were beautiful. I was really explained for every sector something that me as development economist, or if I had been a World Bank official, I'd said, wow, they really know what the best practice is. They know exactly what needs to happen in this country. And, and, and this is amazing. The main thing, though, when I walked out, I told one of my colleagues and said, wow, this was quite a piece of theater because nothing will happen. I was convinced that I had good reasons to know that actually nothing would happen. In fact, DRC was a country at the time, and it still occasionally happens, doesn't even get its budget approved in Parliament in time for the end of the fiscal year. So think of it, yet all the government spending is done without an approved budget. Okay, so that's not really a place where I would believe a plan will ever be implemented because you have not even managed to get your budget allocation uh, sorted in, in, in time to, to, to have actually a, a legal right to spend. Of course, spending happens, but in all kinds of different ways. In Ethiopia, we had a similar meeting, 
But there, the meeting, the, the, in, in the meeting, the plants were actually far less impressive. They were actually quite difficult. And yeah, they were all, they like to call it homemade. They were very specific for the country that gave us all kinds of details. But actually, you know, as, as an economist, they would say, mm, there's certain things that are not going to work and that are going to go wrong. But I remember there, we were there, we actually with four other experts from the US, from the UK, from China, actually in the room. And all four of us said afterwards, wow, this is actually, they're going to do this and it probably will work. And in fact, this was in uh, about 2013, 2014, uh, if I recall well. Um, and basically this was the period that they became the fastest growing economy. Now it's that difference that I need to explain. Why is it that the country with perfect plans and policies that, that it seems to be one to implement where nothing ever happens and no progress is made, why a country with imperfections, but actually may well achieve quite a lot. And that's what I'm trying to do in the, in the, in the book. And behind it is, um, behind it, and I have to hurry up a little bit, behind it is, is, is a lot of um, thinking from other people as well, Douglas North and so on, and, and actually a very simple conception of the state. You know, you can read it there on the slide, but in, in a book, Douglas North is a Nobel Prize winner in, in, in economics. He's an economic historian in his last book. He basically said, well, you think of a state as a, a coalition of people uh, that in, uh, belonging to elite groups that somehow decide to stop fighting and plundering, but actually, work together with some for some reasonable stability but also with some rules about how they will access valuable resources and who can do what in this in this society so they it's a bit like that that in his view states emerged historically when you know rather than having roving bandits you know militias moving around gangs moving around and plunder actually they make a deal and say well why don't we actually get some peace together and we will we'll control who has access to the resources and who has uh, who can do the activities. Now, that sounds like a very cynical view of societies, but it may well be that is a good way of thinking about how they emerge. And I will want to argue it's not a bad way to still think of of societies as they exist today. And so, in the book, I like to think of it as a as a state, as essentially a bargain amongst those groups and individuals that have power and influence in a society and somehow make a bargain about um about you know stability in the place a minimum is a coalition for peace and stability you know and um you know there's a way and we can if you want to talk about that you could think about it for example uh congress in india at the time of independence was a coalition between different groups representing actually different elites from commercial groups to uh, or, or, or small scale business people uh, as well as landowners in the country and basically somehow a deal look this is a way of how we're going to try to to build up a state here here in india so it's a kind of a coalition for peace and stability among groups now who do i mean with the elite this is not one leader this is also not five people. This is actually, broadly speaking, the people with power and influence. They can, they will come from from politics, from the military. They will come from uh, civil society, actually, from civil service, from from business, of course, importantly as well. So across all these different groups, people with some power and influence, and then at any moment in time, they may form a power coalition that they may control, actually, the, the decision making. But broadly speaking. The stability in a country is determined by this kind of broader than just those people who narrowly are controlling politics at the moment in time. So think of a state in any moment in time as an elite bargain. And it always will involve a political deal of how somehow, uh, how can you control the state? What are the rules of the game for controlling the state? But also an economic deal, who has access to resources and the distributions of it. So. And I always want to emphasize, you know, this is there is no perfection here in any society in the world. You know, in the UK, we have a society where, yes, we have a particular political deal that is, you know, um, general suffrage, people can vote people in power as well, and people tend to respect this. Of course, there is still a lot of power of who can finance politics and who can campaign and so on. Clearly, an economic deal matters as well of how you can get access to the state 
uh, campaign finance and so on. And it goes even further. You know, we have uh, a situation that if you happen to be somehow carrying the sword of a Norman prince in the 12th century, and you happen to be coming over from France then with William the Conqueror, then actually uh, in the 12th century, there's a very good chance that your family is still extremely rich today because you would have been rewarded with land and we recognize inheritance rights that people that were rich in the 13th century, they can still be rich today due to inheritance rights. So we all have rules of the game of how you get access and so on. And, and all societies have something there. Of course, we can have lots of political deals and economic deals. Some are a bit more based on, well, if I control the state and I can steal from all the people in the, in the country, this is how I would typify, I think, the DRC, uh, where basically it's very much a deal that a kleptocracy, as we call it. Uh, you could also have a very clientelist state and saying, look, I'm building up a state. But basically, if you want a job in the state, uh, you better be connected to me because I only reward people with connections to me that support me with the jobs, with contracts and so on. And of course, then we get into some, some uh, practices that in India may well still be prevalent that actually there's clientelist uh, tendencies as well. Where do I come then and, uh, to the kind of big thesis of the book? Well, if you want growth and development, you better have underlying this elite bargain enough commitment to growth and development. Okay, that it means enough long-term commitment, enough focus on investment, not just distributed to your friends, but actually really trying to invest in future development, really trying to do things that actually are forward focusing, that are caring about what do I need to do rightly for growth? What do I need to do for development? You need to have an elite bargain that values that's enough. That's enough. And my thesis is basically, if I go into the case studies in different places, countries who had that, uh, they at some point, they will start progressing. It's a precondition, but countries who don't have enough of that, it's just not going to happen. So it means you need to be serious about peace and stability. You don't do from an ideological reason to have a strong state over weak state or central or state-led development or non-state development. You do what you can in the service of growth and development. So in, in Bangladesh, you stay away from a lot of things. You give space for export orientation from industries and so on. We could talk a long, much more about it, but the state needs self-aware. And somehow uh, the bureaucracy and the politics needs to be willing to correct errors. You need to have some forms of accountability, some forms of learning. So what, you, what I want to emphasize, it doesn't need perfect institutions. There can be imperfections, but it needs that underlying common purpose, that online shared commitment, that common, uh, common mindset of those with power and influence that they want to succeed in growth and development. This is not about market versus state-led development. You use the state to extent that you have the capabilities. And I would say very few countries, probably none, have the capabilities that the Chinese state had in 1979 in terms of the control. And I think some of the history of India showed the state overreaching at times uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the 1960s, 70s, probably didn't help uh, India's development. Also, and I will not go into much detail here about it, it's not per se a democracy or an autocracy. I don't make a big statement about it. Basically, there's democracies that don't make progress and there's democracies that make progress. Um, but you do need some form of internal external accountability. You need some accountability progress. Otherwise, there's no way of learning. You know, if, if somehow you keep on giving your procurement contracts to the wrong people and you, the state loses a lot of money, you'll need to work on that because you can't sustain that because you'll keep on losing money and infrastructure projects will be poor delivered and nothing will happen. So you need something internal, external. And in the book, I talk how different countries did this. What about the people here? Of course, people matter. But my contention is, is that these elite groups, they can block progress. You know, surely people have their role and often they can provide pressure. They can also make sure that um, that put pressure on, on political leaders or business leaders that they have some legitimacy in the way they do their practices. But it is somehow my contention that elites have a, have a blocking thing. That's why I want to emphasize these elite parts. Now, what makes it very remarkable to me, elites have very few incentives to change because usually the status quo suits them well. The states of quo, status quo of businesses, of, of uh, political leaders, you know, 
They can control the state, they can get the benefits for it, they can control the processes. You know, it's, it's somehow status quo suits them. So if we observe a country that actually choosing the longer term growth and development, it's actually a gamble for the political class. And it's a gamble for those in the in the business class because it actually tends to disrupt through growth, through through the changes that are happening in economy and society. It may actually undermine the political uh, the political um, the political status quo. And so, actually, it makes it even more remarkable that some countries did it. That they took that gamble, and that's why I call it a gamble for development because it's not self evident that it will be successful. And actually. Um, it makes it actually quite striking that countries did it. Now, I think of a lot of countries, and I think I want to say a little bit more how I think about India here. And so in the 1990s, I think actually, and I argue in the book, that somehow or another, compared to the 1980s and the 70s, there was actually an emergence of a quasi-development bargain. There was definitely beforehand already a, uh, an elite bargain for peace and stability. It was there, there was definitely there you know, the, the stabilization of the country after um, after the split and after independence and, 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 the, and the dramatic events then, there was definitely an elite bargain for peace and stability, but only in the 1990s, I would say there's the emergence of quasi-development bargain. And the point is not simply that we said, oh, the economy got liberalized in 1991 when Manmohan Singh was the, the finance minister. No, he used the opportunity well. But actually, I would argue it was more during the 1990s that more and more of the political parties and the last one to follow was the, the BJP to actually make growth and development a central platform in the way they thought about politics and development. And basically, you got somehow from the 99, late 1990s onwards, broadly credible politics continued for reasonable stability, a somewhat more self-aware state that actually knew that it didn't have to, the whole license raj was slowly dismantled and ever so slowly, it's still very much there, acting that it started to act more within the capability, allowed more space for entrepreneurship and initiative, and somewhat more error correction, actually not least in terms of learning how to do development programs, transfer programs, it's still not perfect, but it's definitely a lot of progress. Importantly, with huge difference across states, and I would argue that it's actually quite interesting when you look at Indian history on that, that probably in the 1980s, we saw this emerging in states like probably Tamil Nadu and some other southern states before it actually became the mainstay at the center. And there's still, as I argued earlier, I don't think we have a development bargain in the politics in UP. We may or may not have had a few signs of it in Bihar, but I think it's all very weak. Um, and basically, it helps to explain why these places stay behind. Put it differently, those people in control of the state uh, have totally different objectives than actually trying to actually grow and develop the state. I would actually say it's a precondition for growth. This is basically, for me also, was the difference between Ethiopia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. In Ethiopia, we definitely had that at that time as well, this, uh, this, this, this issue. Where are we now? I think in India, there's a lot of people that say the end is nigh. I'm not entirely sure. There's people like Glenn Pritchard have written about it, that they really think this kind of catch-up phase of growth that India has been having, that it actually is not quite right. And this probably needs renewal. And that's a quite a normal thing. Every country will need a renewal of this development bargain, otherwise it will run out of steam. And the status quo seems to be very attractive for all kinds of uh, groups within the politics and bureaucracy and business and so on. And of course, ideology is back. And if we think back of the Chinese history in the 1970s, why it was such a change, actually in the 1970s, it was uh, 1960, 70, there was a total domination of ideology, of ideas, of, 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 of nationalist narratives. Actually, pragmatism was the big change factor in the 19, after 1979 in China. To be honest, we also worry about China at the moment as well, where national ideology dominates pragmatism as well. And I think something that India probably uh, I would be concerned about, I think you know exactly what I mean. Finally, what can outsiders do? And I think a lot of us on the call are outsiders. You know, we may have be connected to people in the lit, but you know, if you're a think tank or other things, what can you do? 
What I don't think you can do much with is these kind of grant initiatives in New York. You know, this is a picture from 2000, sorry, from 2000 at the time of the Millennium Declaration that we started the MDGs. It's all good, nothing wrong with it. Sustainable development goals, all very good. But basically, there's a lot of crooks who signed the sustainable development goals, and there's no signature in New York that will ever change a crook from not to, to not being a crook. They're just crooks. There's several people in this picture that are indicted by the International Court of Justice. There's several uh, people on this picture that later on were uh, convicted or definitely strongly accused amid good evidence of grand corruption. There's a lot of uh, not very friendly people there um, that I don't think have the good of the world or of their countries in mind. So I don't think that signature on the sustainable development goal helps us very much. What I do think is that um, we should just be aware that it's very hard. And take, for example, aid, which is not a focus on it, and I'll very quickly go past this. You know, if there's a development bargain in the country, you know, outsiders with finance, whether it's the World Bank or the UN or whatever, of course, then it's very easy to, help, to, to provide some support. If countries really want to make progress, if the elite really wants to make progress, then actually some extra finance from outside, some extra support is really good. The problem is really, if you don't want a development bargain, if the underlying elite bargain in a country is not developmental, so what's the point of actually doing something? And the problem with a lot of the things we may end up doing is that you risk embedding uh, the, the, a bad elite bargain there, and you may actually harm future generations as well. Now, but how do we then think finally about what to do about all this? Well, the main thing, and I think for, for people on the call, is to actually, whenever we work as more technical, give technical, do technical things, whether it's policy advice or whether we give uh, economic advice or, or, or capacity building advice or whatever we do, we should always have in mind is that actually, if we're not careful, we embed, we make stronger people that really don't want much progress. At the same time, we should direct our incentives, our work towards, you know, nudging along a better lead uh, bargain towards development and away from non-development bargains. So the minimal amount is, whatever you do in technical advice, understand politics, understand very carefully why certain policies are done, why certain reforms can't happen, and so on. And then find the right people in positions of power and influence that you try to influence as well, that you try to invest in, maybe even put better people in these positions that actually make a better development bargain more likely. And basically, think about narratives of shared commitments. You know, you're basically thinking not just kind of soft talk about, oh, please focus on development, but basically, you know, what are the grounds, the, 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 the building blocks that you can have that are forward looking, finding some entry points and saying, you know, can we actually nudge something forward? Okay, so it's, it's finding these entry points to actually do it. It's very hard to do, but there's an, an academic, Lan Pritchard, who actually wrote a paper at some point, and he said a lot of the support to think tanks in the 1980s that encouraged somewhat more market orientation, somewhat more outward orientation of India, actually probably was incredibly helpful to give the confidence in the 1990s to political leaders from different colors and to technocrats as well, to argue for some of the reforms that started to happen in the 1990s and set India up to a, towards a stage of much faster growth and also creating the conditions for more development. Actually, that is possible, but you, you but investing in the night in the, the right narratives. And so something that was striking at that time was that actually a lot of the talk about, you know, you you can actually compete in the world, you can actually be part of the world economy. You, you have something there that you can gain from markets can actually work in India as well. You can make them work for poor people as well, was actually quite useful in that respect. So I'm going to stop now. And sorry, I've talked a little bit longer, but there's still, I hope, 15, 20 minutes for, for, for questions. Thank you. So will someone uh, guide the discussion or should I pick hello. up questions hello. myself? Hello. Oh, hi, come actually. Yeah, hi. Nice to see you, Professor Dogon. And thank you so much for your excellent and erudite special address. Now, you know, we'll take some questions. Uh, so there is this question in the chat box that in your view, 
which country lives up to your expectations in overcoming poverty and other challenges as well as what do you think of development with the current taliban takeover of afghanistan government from the past to present the first thing i want to say is that on the first question no country is perfect you know i'm going to name a few countries but you know it's in a world of imperfections there's a lot of bad things we can say about it so i am actually you know if i look back in over the last few decades you know i am impressed with bangladesh because it was such in such a bad condition but i'm also impressed with ghana uh, another another country just as I'm actually quite impressed with some states in India, I'm, I'm not always impressed totally with the center, but actually some states in India and, and some of the states that I mentioned, you know, the southern states, there's actually quite a lot of progress happened. You know, they're messy and there's all kinds of stuff. But, you know, if you think of, you know, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, there's things to be said that actually are uh, things. So do they live up to my expectations? I hope they're higher than what they achieved. Um, but there is something there, you know, I want to... I want to not say success should be defined in terms of Taiwan and Korea, because I don't think there will be any more that the, the global environment and the domestic environment of other countries is very different to actually be able to achieve the Taiwan Korea thing. So I want to judge it on a on a different basis. And then in that sense, you know, there are countries that I can that, that we can applaud. Afghanistan is really interesting. So I'm very negative about the 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 way uh, the government in Afghanistan before the takeover of the Taliban that was not a developmental government that was definitely not a government that actually fundamentally was based on an elite bargain for development this was an elite bargain in fact if anything it was an elite bargain between former warlords very corrupt players in business and so on and, it, and ever since um, the, the the Western intervention in 2000 and um, in, in, in after 9-11, um, it actually, it never managed to get actually a, a, a government in power that had an elite bargain that actually was developmental. Now, the Taliban, they're also definitely not developmental. It's definitely not, they have a very, and in fact, it's one of these examples of an elite bargain that is very much focused on an, okay, call it an ideological, or in this case, a religious narrative and a narrow interpretation of a religion that actually they make an ideology of, of how you should run a state. That's, for them, it's more important to do that ideology than actually to run the country so that it actually progresses for people. So no, that absolutely is not a development bargain either. So in both cases, it was actually an elite bargain that is you know, absolutely not in my category. And I'm, I'm not very hopeful for Afghanistan that it will now suddenly progress. Yes, it in the more for the moment it has a form of peace and stability, but the Taliban is not going to don't, don't show any signs of going to do anything sensible with it, which is of course a problem because I have no answer to that. You know what you do in the, at the time of Ashraf Ghani or Karzai in Afghanistan. I don't have an obvious answer how an outsider could have fixed that. One of my big similarly now one of my big theses is that if you just don't get the underlying elite the people with power and influence in your society get together there's nothing that an outsider can change whether it's through aid or military intervention or pressure from geopolitics it's just not going to happen thank you so much professor Delpon. uh so i have a question that what according to you should be the economic policy for supporting the development of entrepreneurship and innovation right it's it's a it's a, it's an interesting question. So over the years as chief economist, I ended up traveling around a lot of places that all put innovation and entrepreneurship at the center. And so we started seeing initiatives, and that's in every country. I saw little uh, startup places, startup zones, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to be challenging here because I'm I I turned quite cynical about them. I turned out quite cynical because. I saw them in Nigeria, I saw them in Zambia, I saw them in Ethiopia, I saw them in India. Um, if the underlying climate is not conducive for, for change and entrepreneurship, the underlying climate, there's nothing that these initiatives can ever de deliver. So, in, so what I saw as in Nigeria, I saw endless copying of apps that were developed in London and New York, and are supposedly there, which basically would only work 
if you had a large middle class population that could actually use them. So you start just copying. There was entrepreneurship that was just copying. And so I remember one, uh, one uh, woman, and, and she was very impressive, but I asked, how many customers do you have? And she had done some transport app on bus transport, safe bus transport for women. She had nine customers, basically nine people who had ever used the app. Now, that's basically where you get so... So initiative don't work. All these initiatives, all the kind of little startup centers and all these things, they don't work. You need an overarching underlying climate that actually is positive for growth. And then, and the second thing is, that doesn't want to capture any new incumbents. Okay, so that's an interesting thing that I want to briefly develop. So take, for example, technology sector. You know, something where a lot of entrepreneurship is possible because it's a new sector and so on. And of course, in India, it's been a massive success. But actually come to think of it, why in the 1990s did the technology sector in Bangalore and so on manage to work? Well, there was a bit of good luck that actually several of the people returned back from the US, including some because their visas were revoked. Uh, there was a visa situation in the early 90s. They set up. But somehow the state didn't early on trying to capture it. So it was actually, it could evolve by being left alone. And why did the state not capture it? Because it wasn't challenging any incumbents in the state uh, that actually were challenging it. So, and that's actually why some of these sectors, these newer sectors, even in India, where the state love to control, love to license, love to be somehow have the fingers in the till, um, it actually didn't happen because there was space left for it. So, so the advice that I would typically give is that a policy, a policy for entrepreneurship is to basically give it space, have a good climate for it, but don't try to capture it. So try to actually avoid to be too much all over it. I'm a bit worried whenever a chief minister will announce some new innovation stuff or something, because then the space is not there, because it's probably the space in India where new emerging private sector can come into it before it gets stifled in, in endless rules and regulations. And history tells it there as well. So it's, and in a way, what I've suggested here is actually, you can't think, you can't not think about politics. Otherwise, if you just pure t treat innovation and entrepreneurship as a pure technocratic thing, I'm pretty sure that at some point or another, the political economy will come and, and try to get it and control it and whatever. So that's what I would, would say. Um, thank you, Professor Doka. Another question is that, that uh, while talking about the, you know, the uh, economic policy for the entrepreneurship and innovation, so what according to you, you know, are the most effective instruments like for activating innovation? and entrepreneurship in the field of economic activity? I think the main, you know, the, the main characteristics of places where actually um, new, new industries have been able to emerge is places where the investment climate, first of all, and I'll start basically on this broader investment climate, is reasonably conducive for it. So that it basically created space. You know, entrepreneurship needs to, you, you, you should be willing in a, in a country to allow things to spring up in places where you didn't expect them to spring up. You want to actually make sure that there is space. And if you want to become the world leading bucket operate bucket producer, <laughs> plastic buckets, that should be just as acceptable than if you become the, the next high tech uh, Silicon uh, Valley style startup kind of uh, producer. So, so first of all, you know, the policy should be, you know, to, uh, to be conducive for, for various bits and pieces. Then within it, um, the most important thing is, is the policies is to actually learn to stop doing things rather than to just do it. It's to actually, it, and um, I'll give an example. I was in Bangladesh, a high, um, an electronics company that was getting more and more access into the refrigerator markets, sorry, more and most market share in the refrigerators, in um, also, in fact, mobile phone production and so on. So there was a mate in Bangladesh 
uh, the, the company is called Walton, um, growing bigger, bigger and bigger. What the state does is all the time special advantages so that they can actually learn by doing, you know, industrial policies, trying to actually do this. So, and the firm, I must say, is very entrepreneurial, keeps on thinking new product lines that it should actually try to, to build up. I think the main thing that the government needs to learn as policymakers to actually know when to stop giving this support, because otherwise, after a bit, it will just be totally dependent. You know, the biggest failure in, in, in almost entrepreneurship and building up a new industry is in Malaysia, the car industry. After 40 years, the car industry is still heavily subsidized. After 40 years learning by doing, the entrepreneurs that started the firm have never been able to make it profitable. Now, that means you just don't have a good business. You should be willing to let it go. You can't simply rely on government subsidies for 40 years to make, make, a, make a thing. So you, first of all, you need to have a lot of things that can emerge. I'm very happy to support them for a while, but you have to be willing to say, I'm going to stop supporting some of them so I can actually foster some new ones as well. And in that sense, um, it's as, as important to stop doing policies than actually start them. Thank you uh, so much, Professor Dokon. Um, okay, so another question. Sorry, I have a lot of questions from you. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, like, uh, according to you, you know, how can the change in the demographic structure of society, you know, affect the economic development of the country? Right. So, um, I mean, there's, 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 there's some standard, well-proven theories is that the change in demographic structure, so as you are in many Asian countries now, uh, will, will allow you to have, um, you know, essentially a period where you have a very young population that can be very productive, that is young, but not too young, that it's dependent, and so on. So you can actually have that demographic dividend at some point in your, in your country. Now, that's a, that's a pure kind of demographic feeds into the econ economics. The only way a country can take advantage of that is at that moment when it's actually taking the demographic dividend, it actually has an economy focused on rapid expansion of economic activity. And what I'm trying to say is here is that, you know, the, you, you, you need growth, but you need to have the kind of growth that is actually not simply based on the things you were doing before, but actually it's, it's expansionary, it has scope for further productivity growth and so on. So, and, and essentially you need to have a really good investment line then, because if there's no capital then flowing into the economy, there's no way you'll take advantage of this new labor. In fact, you'll create what we have in some African countries and maybe in, in, uh, in some states in India where you have a lot of young people, but extremely few jobs. Uh, because there's actually no creation of new activities going on. Now, um, a related thing, though, is that there's also a bit of a, an issue there, and that's actually a very striking thing that seems to have happened, is that you would have expected that when young people become voters, when they become politically influential, that they actually would be having a very long horizon and being very much promoting progress and growth in your, in your economy. One of the striking things we found first in Western countries uh, much earlier, and we see this now in Asia as well, is that young voters tend to be surprisingly conservative and not terribly forward looking. And they actually vote for ideology more easily than actually for longer term progress. They vote for nationalist agendas rather than longer term agendas. And that's a very striking thing. So I think there's something going wrong. Oh, no, no, there's something clearly going wrong because it's not necessarily in their interest that they actually are short-term thinkers because they'll be running society for decades to come. But actually they, 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 they're installing policies and politics that is actually very short-term. So I think there's a role for young people that are, that are voiced. And I, you know, it's really interesting that, that uh, this is where you could take an example from um, Oh gosh, I forget her name now for a moment, her first name, Thunberg, the, 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 the climate campaigner, 
uh, in, in, uh, in, in Sweden, together with several young climate leaders from all over the world, very young, they actually managed to mobilize young people to actually think along, think longer term. And I think that's, that's not happening in enough societies. It's definitely not happening in my society enough. It's definitely not in Britain happening enough. And it actually is quite important because this is actually where the demographic dividend, you know, this is the moment that, that um, I, I noticed this in Bangladesh actually, where I was the guest of a youth policy forum. Uh, where basically some young people had mobilized, well, they organized 30,000 youngsters over Facebook pages and so on. And politicians suddenly had to listen to 18 and 20 year olds. And I was surprised how many MPs turned up to these meetings. There were six MPs on just the meeting that was organized with three days notice. There were six MPs, there were 40 people there, but six MPs turned up because they know that's the future. And they were actually talking about the renewal of the economic model and the longer term focus of development in Bangladesh. And suddenly they realized they had to listen to because they typically can take it for granted. So there's something about mobilizing, uh, mobilizing the demographic dividend, you know, the, the power of numbers of, uh, of, uh, of the people between uh, 15 and 30 to actually mobilizing them because I think they're underrepresented in politics because they don't organize themselves strongly enough. Thank you, Professor Dokan. Um, another question that uh, does the population explosion like uh, uh, play a positive role in economic growth? Yes, so, so that's, a, that's a very good question. And first of all, the population explosion is past. You know, the population is not anymore exploding. You know, basically Asia is now going into a very different phase. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of countries in Asia already that have to start worrying about aging of the population. The population explosion is now essentially limited to West Africa. And that's actually almost limited, Nigeria uh, and some West African states, very strikingly. Not even, even in East Africa, it's closing down. Ethiopia, that used to have very high population growth and so on. And I would just simply point to Bangladesh is that we all thought at the time this very high population growth of Bangladesh was outpacing, well, it was very close to some of the poorest states in India, if not outpacing it in the 1970s in fertility rates. And everybody was really worried about it. No, it's its people that at the moment provide its power, it's its population density. Economists, when you ask a growth expert, I call it kind of a long-term growth expert, they will usually say, what's the best predictor of long-term growth? Actually, it is in the end population. Now it's a tricky one because the demographic transition is a difficult one to maneuver to. And I, but I do think generally Asia is maneuvering through it well, and some African countries are not doing it because of the thing that I answered you earlier. You need to have that capital investment happening while the demographic transition is happening, while the demogra otherwise you won't have the dividend. But actually population is in the end, uh, is not really stifling. So I tend to kind of say, let's not overstate it, let's not understate it. Of course, transitions are difficult. I'm not trying to encourage increased population growth in Asia, that will not help it. Um, I will definitely, be saying keep an eye on West Africa because it is actually problematic for these countries, that, that, that program. But we shouldn't overstate dem demography. And something I really don't like is people coming from privileged countries in the rich in, in the in the rich worlds, some, some aristocrats in Britain sometimes doing this as well, where they end up blaming climate change entirely on population growth. No, no, no that's actually it's to do with living standards of the rich. Uh, it's nothing to do with the poor. And it's nothing to do with population growth. Thank you, Professor Logan. And also when we talk about uh, the climatic factors and environmental factors, so do you think that there can be a relation and you know how uh, like it, these climatic factors can how they affect the uh, whole economy, according to you? Can you repeat it? I didn't hear that very well. Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, so I was saying that when we talk about climate and you know environmental changes, so uh, when it comes to disaster and development, so these disasters which happen, natural disasters, so according to uh, that, what do you think that, uh, how it affects the economic growth? The impacts on economic growth, actually it's maybe, it's one of these sad things actually to actually have to accept that extreme events they have some impact on GDP, but they're not that much. So that's actually a reason why they don't get as much attention um, somehow. 
it doesn't mean that these are not important disasters. The human cost is actually much more important here, I would say. And, and uh, for me, the economic costs are there and there are ways of handling these, but the human costs are definitely very dramatic. And because it's actually often the most poorest, the most vulnerable, that are most affected then by these extreme events. So, so, you know, let's not treat it as an economic problem on the extreme events. Now, having said that, of course, climate change, if we're not, if we're not careful, it will become a serious economic problem in the second part of this, uh, of this century. Um, and we should not underestimate it because, and it's largely the unpredictability in terms of how the effects will work through the whole system with a lot of potential really downside effects on average temperatures, on, on extreme temperatures. And it's not quite disasters, but it's like, you know, you've gone through heat waves in India and there's things like that. You know, at some point, this kind of, which is not even a disaster, it's not even simply called a disaster, but it's like a real longer term heat wave. There's no in, immediate mortality from it, maybe. There is some, of course, but, uh, but that actually the economic impacts of that, of how to actually have to get inhabitable places, movements, the people that have to move to other places and so on, that, that actually will bring a lot of the economic cost and the disruption there as well. But in the end, you know, the, you know it, it, it's, it's the human cost that I'm mostly concerned with here as well. The, the economic cost we can probably handle, but it's the human cost will be huge. Thank you, Professor Dopan. Uh, we have another question. So how do you think that Greta's uh, influence impacted on climate change? And uh, uh, like, do you see any specific uh, changes that were made, you know, for the uh, sustainable development in the Europe region? Yeah. Well, thank you for reminding me of her first name. I, well, how did I forget it? So Greta Thunberg. No, look, I'm I'm using it more. I mean, she definitely has become an influential person, and the way she's been become an influential person is that she's actually mobilized an awful lot of young people together with, there's from other countries as well, there's a Ugandan woman, I'm sure there's in India as well. You know, they have mobilized people globally. They've actually, they, they have made themselves, so to speak, in my framework a little bit, a person that can influence how the elite is making its deals. And actually, because somehow she can't be ignored. Now, has she changed enough? Of course not. But this is a bit like, it, it gives me more an example of actually how mobilization can actually influence those people in power to actually, um, you know, do certain things. So have they made, you know, in, in a way, the biggest impact, the biggest positive impact we now have on climate change in recent times has, first of all, been COVID because economic activity slowed down. And secondly, uh, the massive rise in oil prices because people are being much more careful with with energy. So actually, in the end, you know, I'm enough of an economist is that that actually it's in the end uh, mobilizing ideas is not enough. Um, it is going to be something about changing the incentives in the in in Western economies that will have to help and and somehow for climate change for the climate in general. It's, it's probably the best thing that could happen. I'm not trying to say what happened in Ukraine was at all good, but, but, but if you think of it in these big shocks and these big changes in the relative cost of energy, this will have a very big impact in our energy transition. Every country now is in a hurry to increase sustainable energy sources because they are not dependent on Russia or geopolitics um, and so on. So, so that's actually there. But yeah, I think she has influence, definitely. I, I can't quantify it. Um, and it's typically not in the short run. But I do think that, that, that movements like that matter and they, they, they are influential. Thank you, Professor Stefan Dokon, for your wonderful special lecture on analyzing development in developing economies at the Rotama Foundation. It was lovely to have you here among us. You made pertinent observations and detailed analysis of the policies of different countries and also a number of substantive issues were discussed including effects of entrepreneurship, population growth, climatic factors and behavior of political elites, how they affect economic growth in various nations across the world. 
I would also like to thank, especially thank Mr. Soham Das, Chairperson and Director, Philotima Foundation, for its opening address at this special session. Thank you so much. And also, I would like to thank our attendees. I hope you all had a chance to learn. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to talk. All right, then. Bye bye, then. Bye. Take care.